To no one's surprise, the most frequently discussed game series on this channel is Silent Hill. Out of the 450 videos I've done on this channel, I've done over 40 on that series. Naturally, I've had viewers ask me why I have a disproportionate fascination and attachment to this series compared to all others. And while there are innumerable reasons, I suppose the biggest and most relevant reason is that it helps me contend with trauma from my own life. See, I murdered my wife. And, uh, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Just trying to introduce some levity to a serious topic. The developers of Silent Hill saturated the games with numerous references to both psychological and spiritual traditions. Specifically, the psychoanalytic theories of Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung, which were then often applied to hermetic traditions like alchemy and the occult. I found that by investigating the concepts that Silent Hill was referencing and identifying similarities with my psychological struggles, I was able to derive greater clarity and sustenance than I did from other forms of medical intervention. Now, as magnificent and helpful as those games were in symbolizing psychological processes and how to overcome them, there is one thing I wish it did better with its depictions of trauma. I think they could have simulated trauma better. See, games have an infinite amount of potential, more than any other medium, to demonstrate how impossible it can seem to overcome the darkness of the past. And while Silent Hill did it well in terms of story and symbolism, I believe that there was more to be desired in terms of gameplay. Granted, there have been some games that have done amazing progressive work in this regard, like Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice and Amori, where gameplay plays a more important role in fostering empathy within the gamer. Nonetheless, they still lacked the equilibrium I was looking for, where gameplay and story both play an equally important role in making the gamer understand the Sisyphean struggle that trauma often poses. But then, a few months ago, I came across a game called Lisa the Painful. Set in a post-apocalyptic world, where all women have mysteriously ceased to exist, Lisa the Painful follows a character named Brad, a man who not only must contend with the existential implications of humanity's inevitable extinction, but also with the abuse he suffered from his father during his childhood. From that brief synopsis, a gamer that knows nothing about Lisa the Painful might question how such a bleak and uncomfortable premise could be enjoyed as a game. The fact of the matter is, though, that Lisa the Painful manages to somehow not only be a massively entertaining and surprisingly innovative RPG, despite the bleakness, it also has one of the best senses of humor that I've ever seen in a game. One that never comes across as disrespectful, nor takes away from the seriousness of the theme. This balancing act of hilarity and despair along with consistently entertaining gameplay would have been impressive on its own. But yet, it manages to do all of this without ever losing sight of its most important function, which, as I said before, was the simulation of trauma, done equally through gameplay and story. The fact that Lisa the Painful managed this, despite the delicacy of the subject matter, and of course the fact that the game was made by one person in the RPG Maker engine, makes the game one of the most impressive works I have ever seen from the medium. And today, I'm going to analyze why. Needless to say, there are spoilers ahead. First, I need to acknowledge for those who are unaware that Lisa the Painful is the second part of a three-part series, or rather the second part of a multi-part series of which only three games are technically official. The other two official games are Lisa the First and Lisa the Joyful. I decided to focus strictly on Lisa the Painful because that's where the vast majority of the content is. After all, Lisa the First is basically a one-hour prequel, and Lisa the Joyful serves as kind of an extended epilogue, kind of like the John Marston section of Red Dead Redemption 2. That said, there is one piece of basic information in Lisa the First that must be pointed out. It introduces us to the aforementioned Brad's sister, the titular Lisa. 
Like Brad, she also suffered unconscionable abuse from their father, which is illustrated symbolically through the game's art direction and puzzles. Unfortunately, unlike Brad, she ultimately could not live with the pain and the shame. It is the tragedy of Lisa's untimely demise that sets the stage for Lisa the Painful. Despite knowing what happened to her, I was tricked by the pleasant breezy music over the opening credits. I suppose that because I started Lisa the Painful right after Lisa the First, I was willing to enthusiastically embrace anything remotely pleasant. But just as I started to feel relaxed, I hear the sounds of punches being thrown and flashes of blood red light up the screen. A young boy and his friends were collectively beat up by local bullies, a fate they suffered because the fallen boy, who is Brad but at a younger age, stole their ball. Brad slowly gets up and walks home, but instead of being met with a concerned parent attending to his wounds, Brad's father, Marty, throws a bottle at him. He then yells, I'm not buying you another shirt. Brad retires to his room and begins to bawl his eyes out, as the game's title slowly comes up on screen. The game then jumps forward a few decades into the literal post-apocalypse. A mysterious event known as The Flash wiped out every female human on Earth, leaving only the males to fend for themselves. We see Brad, now a middle-aged man, still plagued by the demons of his past, while also trying to contend with life following the end of the world. He addresses his pain, mostly, through his use of a drug called Joy. A drug that, according to its official description, makes you feel nothing. A few seconds after Brad pops a pill, he hears a sound that should be impossible. That of a baby's cries. Upon investigation, he discovers that the baby is not only real, but a female baby. Instead of questioning where this literal miracle came from, Brad decides to take the baby home and raise her in a safe environment. That way, she wouldn't risk suffering the inevitable fate that would befall the only female left in the world. Best of all for Brad, he now has a newfound meaning to sustain him in the apocalypse this little girl that he decides to name Buddy. The first five minutes of the game set up the cyclical pattern that trauma follows. We are in a stable, contented mindset, only for that to be quickly ripped away by something unexpected and awful, be it something horrible happening in the present or a traumatic memory. Then, we try to find someone or something precious that we will do anything to hold on to, that helps us contend with that trauma. This is more or less how the endless battle against trauma goes, and it is a pattern that Lisa the Painful uses as the predicate for both its story and its gameplay. That cycle is kicked off when Brad discovers one day that Buddy had been supposedly kidnapped. From that point, it is up to Brad and the player to trudge through the wasteland, while finding precious resources and reliable companions to sustain them on the quest to find Buddy, the one thing that can keep Brad going in the apocalypse. But be weary, the items you find and the friends you adopt will often be taken from you. And unlike with a lot of RPGs, you will be inconvenienced, to say the least, by their permanent absence. I will go more into this game's RPG systems and how they mirror the cycle of trauma in a moment. Before I do, I must give enormous credit to the way that Lisa the Painful makes use of humanity's most tried and true coping mechanism, humor. Despite literally having one of the bleakest scenarios in the history of gaming, Lisa the Painful also, ironically, has one of the best senses of humor. Though tragedy is everywhere you look, it is often dressed up in a way that compels laughter. In a world without women, men will use pornographic magazines as currency. Some will wear stereotypically feminine and sexy clothes to please other men. Fast food becomes the focus of a religion. If you think about it for more than a few seconds, it's all a deeply depressing display of masculine base instincts, which is why you have to focus in on the absurdity and laugh at it. 
Unlike the games I mentioned previously, which tend to dwell in the feelings of darkness and despair with little reprieve, Lisa the Painful used humor to provoke a mindset that is closer to what a lot of us would probably adopt in tragic circumstances. Best of all, the humor not only consistently lands from beginning to end, it manages to be respectful without ever losing its edge. By making humor omnipresent, it makes the moments when something truly dark and truly unfunny happens even more impactful. For myself, those moments reminded me of the times when my own coping mechanisms completely failed, and I was left vulnerable to the encroachment of my inner darkness. Yet, instead of letting yourself be consumed, you learn ways of getting back up again, which is a skill that Lisa the Painful helps you hone. Just as any therapist will teach their clients to use cognitive reframing as a coping mechanism, Lisa does the same by gamifying trauma. To explain what I mean, I will cite the aforementioned Silent Hill and Hellblade. Though swinging a weapon at the physical manifestation of one's psyche is symbolically resonant, it doesn't necessarily convey the difficulty, the vulnerability the protagonist feels against those threats. In other words, watching somebody fight promised consort Radon in Elden Ring is different than fighting him yourself. Lisa, however, manages to convey that physical and psychological struggle in a very unique way. It takes multiple conventional RPG mechanics and flips them on their head. So for instance, with most RPGs, one can rely on the process of grinding when all else fails, where you fight lower level enemies for hours on end so you can gain precious money and experience points. If you do it enough, you can probably kill a high-level boss with just a couple of smacks. Lisa, however, discourages and punishes grinding the same way that Spec Ops The Line punishes a happy trigger finger. Now that's not to say that you can't grind, it's just not at all optimal. Instead of relying on grinding, Lisa forces you to seek out the limited number of precious resources there are and be as strategic as you can with them, be it currency, items, or party members. Going back to what I said before about the cycle of trauma, Lisa the Painful will constantly feature instances where you will be in a stable frame of mind, only for something to come out of nowhere and smack you upside the head, sometimes metaphorically, sometimes literally. In terms of story, this will come in the form of instantaneous flashbacks to traumatic events or visions of Lisa. In terms of gameplay, there are innumerable times where you will have to give up the few resources you manage to hoard. That and or they will be stolen from you. This will happen with boss fights, pivotal story moments, and even random number generated events. An early example involves seeking out firebombs which you create from discarded beer bottles and diesel. The diesel is relatively difficult to come across, and really comes in handy during a boss battle. However, when I used firebombs to defeat one difficult boss, I found it borderline impossible to fight the next boss which came a half hour later. So, I had to go back a half hour and try to find other resources which would have helped me in the previous battle, so I could save those firebombs for later. The RNG events happen when you decide to rest, which restores the health of both you and your party. Sometimes nothing happens, but there's a significant risk that something will. A spider could come and poison you. Your items or magazines could be stolen. You could be kidnapped. And other times it looks like something is going to happen, but it's just some weirdo watching you sleep. Then there are the predetermined events where you have to lose something no matter what. But these almost always come with a choice. You can either lose all your items or permanently lose a party member. You can lose all your mags or face an impossible boss encounter. And these are just some of the least awful examples. Added together, these moments instill encroaching feelings of paranoia and anxiety within the player, not unlike the paranoia and anxiety that lingering trauma produce. In both cases, you're always expecting something bad to happen, which does make you more prepared for the pain when it does happen, but it's at the cost of any potential feelings of joy. 
At first, it's just a matter of hoarding whatever you find in Lisa the Painful. But as more of those unexpected events eat away at your resources, you slowly develop a belief that no matter what you do, no matter how much you plan ahead or save, you're probably going to lose everything and get to a point where you can no longer advance. And the fact of the matter is that unless you're a god-tier player, that's going to happen. Of course, it's not at all uncommon for real-life tragedies to instill the same belief. But yet, the majority of us find the will to move forward. And that's what Lisa the Painful encourages you to do. It wants you to accept that these bad things are going to happen to you, to choose to ignore your previous save data and find ways to move forward nonetheless, no matter how hard things get. After all, life doesn't have save data. In that sense, Lisa the Painful reframes trauma into a game, and offers many fulfilling and, oddly enough, fun opportunities for both Brad and the player to accept the seemingly insurmountable odds and find ways to overcome. And like I said about the humor, the gamification never ignores the seriousness of the subject matter. That said, as we all know, there are some instances where reframing is easier said than done. Truthfully, there will be times when something so awful happens that we give up. There are two powerful moments in this game that highlight this inevitability. One is in a partially hidden optional boss fight in the definitive edition of the game. During the boss fight, you enter a Silent Hill-esque nightmare where you and your party fight a gargantuan mound of flesh, with your abusive father's head mounted up top. Whether you're playing this on normal or the hardest quote-unquote painful difficulty, this fight will probably be one of the most brutal you will ever encounter in an RPG. Not only is Marty's health extremely high, his battle features multiple phases that increase in difficulty, he is constantly taking out members of your party that you can't bring back, and worst of all, the battle takes forever. If you look at any video of this boss fight on YouTube, virtually all of them take at least an hour. It's insane, and it's a perfect encapsulation of how draining it can be to contend with the source of our trauma, especially with the way it ends. One might expect that defeating a boss this difficult would amount to Brad overcoming his trauma, but it doesn't. As the Nightmare Marty subtly hints, nothing will be resolved through violence. The only way out of both their trauma is by accepting the reality of Lisa's death, with Marty accepting responsibility and Brad accepting that he had none. Yet, it is through trying to accept responsibility that the Nightmare Marty is ultimately defeated. Not by us fighting him, but by his guilt. Now, it's up to Brad to try to succeed where Marty could not. Shortly after this boss fight, one will discover that Brad's father is not only still alive, but has been sheltering Buddy. At this moment, the player is given the choice to either kill Marty out of revenge for all the pain he caused, or to let him live. Of course, letting Marty live would be a powerful testament to the human will. But the fact of the matter is, that if most of us were in Brad's shoes, very few, if any, would possess the will to suppress our instincts in this moment. And Lisa the Painful acknowledges this in a brilliant way. Even if you choose to let Marty live, Brad kills him anyway. In this moment, the rational will is overridden by anger and resentment, and the inner demons come out and possess you, turning you into something completely foreign to yourself. I'm sure that a lot of people watching can relate to this. Even the most compassionate people have moments in their lives where they feel backed into a corner by trauma and feel that inner beast rising within, ready to take control, ready to override your will, ready to perpetuate the cycle of trauma that you swore would stop with you. This moment was such a powerful reminder that there are times when humans won't be fully in control of the choices they make. 
It was so powerful that it temporarily made me forget about the fact that the game up until this point featured a variety of instances when a choice was available. What brought me back to reality, though, was the ending. After Brad fights through hordes of enemies to get to Buddy, she confirms something that had been hinted at throughout the game. Buddy wasn't kidnapped, she left on her own volition. Though the opening of the game insinuates that Brad was trying to be a good father figure, it is revealed that he made two primary mistakes while raising Buddy. First, he abused the aforementioned drug called Joy, which would provide him temporary relief but only caused his trauma to strengthen its grip on him. Second is that he didn't treat Buddy as her own independent agent, with her own hopes and aspirations, and instead used her more as a crutch to deal with his past. One could reasonably surmise that if Brad addressed these issues, he could have had the relationship with Buddy that he always desired. But having not done so, he meets one of the bleakest endings in the history of video games. Despite this, one must not lose sight of what I believe is Lisa the Painful's core message. Even if there are instances where the pain gets to be overwhelming, and there will be, there are various things within our power to change before these moments happen. There are countless ways that we can make our lives and the lives of people around us better, as Lisa the Painful clearly demonstrates. And even in those trying moments, which no amount of good karma can prevent, where the random whims of life can swoop in and take everything from us, we still, in the majority of cases, can choose how we react. As Viktor Frankl said in Man's Search for Meaning, everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way.